Hello and welcome back to the Warcraft News, where week two is almost over, week two of Shadowlands, and that means that season one is looming, comes out next reset. So, in today's news show, we have got your week two goals, with a whole bunch of little tips mixed throughout, then also some things to think about for week three, as well as exciting new lore revelations, quality of life changes that Blizzard have added to the game, some general WoW updates, and, of course, a bunch more. Also, it's a new Patreon month, it is December, and it's a frosty one, because it is Death Knight month. So yes, there will be the Death Knight pin this month. Here is a pre-production uh, pick of um, sort of like the first sort of stamped out version, and this is before it's been plated. It's actually going to be a silvery color. Also this month, art, of course, you'll get that, you'll get the sticker, all good stuff, and also the Patreon vlogs. So now the channel is out, I've actually got time to shake up how we actually run things over here, and I'll be documenting efforts on Patreon. Also, there's the Daily Briefing, our daily news service. So, that's what's up there. A big thank you to them for supporting our Shadowlands efforts, and let's go. Okay, so as you went into Season 2, there's a decent chance you're around eye level 170, you hopefully had your 810 Soul Ash, and were in now in Rank 3 with your Covenant. Really, Week 1 was pretty light on progression, which I actually appreciated a lot. Uh, week 2, though, is where we're getting our final pre-Season 1 prep in. So, let's do a rundown of how you can get maximum benefit from Week 2. Perhaps this will give you your list of things to finish for the weekend, and uh, get yourself fighting fit for Season 1. So first, Obviously, ensure you do your renown quests. That's um, getting five souls in the mob, which takes no time, and a thousand anima. And we've really found the most efficient way to fill up your anima reservoir is doing dungeons and like the PvP quests. Um, the trading favor is PvE quests, at least for us, were Plaguefall and Sanguine Deaths this week. And just doing those, which we were doing anyway, gave us 175 anima each. Then also, this week's Observing War PvP quest, for, um, for it's for Epic Battlegrounds this time, that's 250 anima and 500 honor. Then, for us, there's against overwhelming odds, which gives a whole bunch of anima as well. I mean, wow, you can get anima just by doing the stuff you're already doing. It's pretty sweet. Um, and of course, you can fill that in with a few, you know, world quests, treasure finds, or adventures. Um, but I will say to Blizz, I've really liked how, you know, you can just get anima from doing the stuff you want. If you're a world quester, you're going to get some anima. Uh, if you're a raider or whatever, you know, it just it caters to everyone actually quite well. And they've got that thing where I don't feel like I've got to grind out anima all the time but I still feel it to be quite rewarding when I fill up my Anima Reservoir. And I think that means Blizzard are approaching a pretty damn good balance for the game. Next up, Adventures. Handing in the first renowned quest will actually award rank 4 of renown and a new adventure companion. I would suggest immediately assigning them along with your highest level companion to a bonus experience adventure. That's what I did, and that will get your new companion to about half the level of your highest level companion, and they should then be ready for doing solo duty. And by now, you'll have three companions, including the one you will have got from Torghast. Now, these, um, these missions are really worth doing, right? Then get your reputation, which is nice to have, crafting materials, anima, even mounts eventually, and of course, soul ash. And that soul ash is really good to get, so I think they're really worth leveling up. Then next up, Soul Binds, where there have been some things going on this week. The next renowned hand in that you do will have taken you to renowned five. That will have unlocked chapter three of your Covenant campaign. Finishing that chapter will have got you another renown and, of course, a piece of 155 gear. And I believe enough renown to have unlocked your second Soul Bind. That's um, Clea, M Emeni, <laughs> Dreamweaver, or Theotar. Um, now, at this stage, I'd say, you know, it's pretty early with conduits, so, you know, experiment, figure out what you need, try to farm them up. Um, I've been trying to fill mine in with the world quests, and if you're interested in that kind of gameplay, I'll point out to you that Blood Mallet has actually got his initial work up in his site, so if you want to see how various things are actually stacking up, check out Blood Mallet. He had us covered in the past, and it seems like he's going to have us covered for the future. Then next week, at Renown 7, which will be, you'll get that very early on in the week, you'll be unlocking uh, row 4 on your first soul bind, so that'll become a bit more of a consideration. Then it's also worth calling out that completing Chapter 3 gives you a further Renown rank, which unlocks uh, one of our first STEM cosmetic pack slots. That's, you know, the Halo of the Harmonious, the Standard of the Necrolords, the Night Courtier's Bulb, or the Gleaming Crypt Keeper's Mantle, which is all pretty lovely stuff. Next up, Venari, and if you've not been paying attention to them all, really do listen to this section of the video because there's a bunch of things you probably won't really have picked up on. So, this week, 
of course, you'll be pushing up your reputation with Venari. So if you're at tentative with her, you can unlock Perdition Hold. Now, this opens up an additional weekly quest, um, Words of Warning, which awards 1,100 reputation. That's like the highest single rep reward, so it's really worth doing that weekly. Now, gaining Ambivalent with her unlocks the Beast Warrens region of the Maw. Now, the Beast Warrens has got a weekly event named Shade Hound Hunts, and if you kill the final boss, the Forge Shade Hound, well, that will give you a chance at getting the Maw Sworn Soul Hunter mount, which, yes, is mountable in the Maw. So that's pretty sweet. Speaking of getting around them all faster, there's also a four piece set that's been found with a 10% movement set bonus. Yeah, okay, 10%, it's not that much, but it is named the Inscrutable Exile's Garb. It is based on Lewis Carroll's uh, Jabberwocky uh, poem as well. Um, the neck, the two rings, and the back drop from four rares in the Maw, which are named Heralds. Uh, you can find them marked up on the map here. Now, the Herald of uh, Grief, Loss, and Pain provide the materials for Domination's Calling, which then summons in the final Herald of Domination. Um, so, once you've unlocked Perdition Hold, then go to the Altar of Domination, domination on the upper level, uh, use the calling, and then defeat the boss. So, there's that. Now, there's also been another nice change to the Maw, especially if you've got War Mode on, and that is that Venari provides you with an invisibility cloak after you leave. So, if you're one of the people who is having a wonderful time as my five-player group farmed you for, um, against overwhelming odds, uh, honor kills, then, um, yeah. So, there goes our farming spot, but in fairness, it was a bit of a dickish farming spot as well, so I think this is a good move from Bliss. Then finally, completing the weekly Wrath of the Jailer event also will award an item level 183 piece of gear. That's at one level below Mythic Zero, so for players who can't really access Mythic groups all the time, that's a pretty handy thing to know. Then next up, Soul Ash. Let's talk about that. So this week's Soul Ash cap is uh, 1520, or at least that's what you'll get if you're, you know, doing all of your Torghast. You could get a little bit more, though, for doing the command table. But the core thing is that means you will have enough to craft your first legendary. Now, you might want to hold off, because if you do, then in week two, you'll have enough Soul Ash to make that legendary at rank two, which would be pretty nice. Or you can make two rank one legendaries. Now, I should call out here that many of the hardcore players are waiting until after heroic raid week, though, um, to craft their legendaries because they're worried the Blizzard may rebalance the legendaries in light of getting, you know, a big amount of real world raid testing. So you might want to hold it a little bit. Now, speaking of that, Blizzard have also hotfixed legendary power drop rates from dungeons. They've actually made it so that heroics drop more than normals, and that mythics drop more than heroics, which overall means that this is essentially a buff to the drop rate. Um, yeah, one that will, of course, increase your chances of getting what you want before the raids open, which is, uh, yeah, pretty exciting. Uh, then, another thing you might want to do is prep for Castle Nathria, so let's just talk about that. Well, the first eight bosses of Castle Nathria are eye level 200 drops, and uh, the final two are 207. That's at least from the normal difficulty. Uh, your raid group will therefore want to be, you know, 10 to well, maybe 15 item levels under, uh, you know, under that, right? Around, you know, 184, 185. And if you've been running Mythics, you'll probably be around 184. But if you'd like to increase that item level, well, there are the Dark Moon Trinkets, and there are the 190 BOE weapons that you can check out on the auction house. And actually, the drop rates have been so high that, yeah, there's a fair few of them for sale, and their prices really have been dropping. Also, bear in mind that in week 3, your renown gains will actually allow you to upgrade unranked PvP gear to item level 184. That is the same as Mythic Zero Dungeons, so if you don't have access to a Mythic Zero group all the time, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that battleground uh, gear and stuff, that's actually pretty damn useful to have, especially because you can choose whatever slot you want. Then another consideration for Nathri is professions and the like. Um, I'll just say here, one thing we noticed is the, you know, the sort of one short of top tier crafts for like the enchants and stuff, they are so cheap and they'll get you most of the way there. So for most people, that'll be fine. Otherwise though, I found the prices have not been extortionate. So I've stocked up just so I've got stuff in my bags for the next few weeks of gear upgrades. And I would recommend you do the same, especially if you, like us, plan to raid the night the Nathria releases. May as well get all that done in advance. 
Of course, we do have more to look forward to on the 8th of December. First up, PvP. We will have access to Conquest through Arena and Rated Battlegrounds. Conquest is, of course, a weekly capped currency. So I would recommend now trying to find, you know, a two or threes partner for, um, for Arena. It's really fun stuff, and it can be a great source of gear that thankfully is no longer randomized and can be upgraded with honor. Otherwise, it is the beginning of the Mythic Keystones, and the significant changes here that you may not be aware of if you've not been paying super close attention to things is that we've got new affixes. So first up, there is Prideful, right? Where killing non-boss enemies fills a Prideful progress bar, and every 20% that the bar fills, a manifestation of Pride will spawn. Now, they have a Decay Aura and a short-duration AoE stun, so... Be sure to spawn them in a decent location by pushing the progress bar. I mean, if you spawn them in the middle of a whole bunch of ads, you could cascade into a wipe. But it's not all bad news because if you slay the manifestation of pride, you will get a buff that increases damage, mana regen, and movement speed. So that's pretty great. And um, then at Keystone 4, there is the new Inspiring effect that gives some non-boss enemies an AoE buff. The Spiteful affix will then spawn in Spiteful Shades from the corpses of dead enemies, which, uh, yeah, could stack uh, sort of horribly with a few situations. And uh, then finally, at level 7, Storming will give enemies a periodic Whirlwind, which can knock players back. Yeah, I'm uh, glad I'm playing range this time round. Let's talk about the lore, where we've got a new cinematic this week, and it's our first fly-in-the-wall view of our main antagonist, the Jailer. Handing in 15 legendary recipes to the Rune Carver will provide you with the achievement clearing the fog, and also will trigger a cinematic that is from the Rune Carver's point of view. And it basically depicts him being a truly evil dickhead. He is torturing the knowledge out of uh, the Rune Carver that's needed to create weapons and various things, but. The Jailer needs more. He needs what he says is the Rune Carver's grandest design, and he needs it, apparently, to claim the final prize, the secret the First Ones sought to hide. What could that be? I mean, my personal suspicion there is that it's Azeroth, uh, because that's kind of what he wants. Um, now, the grandest designs are, of course, Frostmourne, which is the Rune Carver's, as it says, um, greatest Morn blade, and the Helm of Domination, a crown fit for the King of the Damned, as he says. There's a lot to parse here, and certainly a lot that will be working into our big Who is the Jailer video, if you've been wondering what's really going on there. Um, but first, this does give us the original purpose of these items, right? Uh, it is to help the Jailer, through the wielder of these items, claim the final prize. A prize that the first ones tried to hide. And as I said, I think that might just be Azeroth. Um, of course, the Jailer knows what that prize is for sure, and maybe we'll find out. Second, we know there's more Morn Blades, as they're called, right? Morn Blades. I imagine that Sire Denathrius's Remornia is, is a candidate for that, as one of the Morn Blades, so we'll see what goes on there. Uh, then finally, it does confirm a lot of what we expected about the Helm of uh, Domination and the Lich King. If you, um, basically, right, you see that Lich King series that we did like a month ago, maybe a bit more than a month ago, that's all just been hard confirmed, I would essentially say. So if you, if you skipped out on those, and I think it's got 400,000 views for part one now, so not that many people have, but if you're one of the people who have, Definitely watch it. It'll give you a bit of a mind blow, and it's just being more and more confirmed as uh, Blizzard adds more, you know, lore and stuff uh, into the game. So yes, basically the helm was intended to go on some sort of puppet character and uh, eventually lead to the Jailer's ultimate victory. Obviously, we thwarted that plan, and we don't know the fine details of the whole thing, but a picture is certainly coming together. Um, now, basically what that is, is, you know, the Rune Carver being taken before the Third War, seemingly of the Nas uh, the Nathrezim through Sire to Nathrius, getting, you know, the Lich King to Azeroth, the Lich King being intended to probably wipe the planet out and claim the Jailer's final prize, which was likely Azeroth, because, of course, the Jailer's prize right now in Shadowlands is Azeroth. That's what he wants. Okay, let's pivot away from this super high-stakes cosmic stuff to other stuff. So, the Shadowlands is continuing to ground itself in the history of the game with even more notable names appearing. I mean, Amber Kiernan, she was found. She's a spider now. That certainly is something. Next, we've got the Sinstone of Thielin Krastanov, better known as the Butcher, from Vanilla Skolomance, where uh, he was a massive dickhead. He was one of the darker aspects of classic, a genuinely grisly dude who tortured thousands to death and then created a blood plague that killed thousands more, and it very much seems like he has a long road to redemption. The next, Anaya Dawnrunner, who, if you remember, was a ghost in vanilla Darkshore. You had to uh, kill her, spirit, anyway, and then return her pendant to her lover. 
And uh, yeah, doing that actually released her soul to Ardenweald. So it's quite cool seeing those little links. And then also, Zul'jin. Yep, he was evil, but uh, I mean, hey, that guy and the forest trolls in general had a pretty rough time of it. Anyway, he's in Revendreth, and if you are a blood or void elf, then obviously you have history of the forest trolls, and his dialogue changes to accuse you of stealing his land, his eye, and then his life, which I suppose you did. Then let's round things off for today. So, people have noticed a few quality of life changes since launch. First up, weapon trading restrictions have been reduced, where in BFA, to trade a weapon, it had to have the same amount of hands, the same primary stat, and could be used by your class. That meant the trading weapons around didn't happen as much. But now you only need a equal, um, you know, like a, an equal or higher um, item level weapon in your bag and, uh, you know, for your class to be able to use it, and then you can uh, make the swap. So that actually loosens up some of the training restrictions. That's pretty good. More likely, if you don't need something, you'll be able to hand it off to a friend. Then also, Venari's upgrades for the Maw and Torghast, such as, you know, your first death not counting towards your death counter, well, it turns out those are actually account-wide. And this should really act as a, just a sort of a nice thing. If you've got an alt going, that alt is not going to feel, you know, like they have this humongous grind to catch up for with Stygia. Then also, Blizzard have buffed rogues and warriors in uh, Torghast, which I'm sure they'll be happy about. And then, of course, Naxxramas, right? We've covered it coming out. And there is a slight downside here where Naxxramas and Castle Nathria are essentially coming out at the same time. That's really unfortunate. A bunch of timing here is really unfortunate, but ultimately, Blizzard pretty much had to release Castle Nathria now because if they waited until after, uh, you know, after Christmas and stuff, what would have happened? Well, you know, people would have been able to farm up, uh, you know, if they were doing, like, I mean, they'd just be able to farm up, like, perfect gear. You know, like, if Mythic only was delayed, then you could farm up in Heroic. And if the whole raid was delayed, then would they also then have to delay Mythic Plus and stuff? Because if people could progress along Mythic Plus, but then couldn't, you know, do Nathria, that wouldn't really work either. So, Blizzard were in a bad situation. This is not the best time for Nathria to come out, all things considered, but it's basically the only shot they had. And that does mean that, yes, people will be progression raiding over Christmas. And it also means that, yes, some people will have to choose, what do I do tonight? Do I do Naxxramas? Do I do Nathria? But that said, do you have to wonder, like, how many people are actively playing both games at like, full kilter, full pelt? I would have imagined it would have made more sense for Naxxramas to come out, honestly, a bit later, instead of really crowding the release schedule. But maybe that could even indicate to us that Blizzard actually don't view the vanilla community, uh, or the classic community, and the live community as really being the same one. Maybe Blizzard actually do see it as two decently distinct player bases. And to be honest, based on my personal experience, I think that is kind of the case. Um, let me know what it is for you. And with that said, that's it for today's episode of the news. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. I've got nothing else, not that much else happened. If you'd like to check out some other things, get some cool loot, the Death Knight pin, some BTS, uh, not, not the band, behind the scenes things, um, you can check out the Patreon, which really does help all of what we're doing. That's it for me. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.